Hello, Hidden Gems. Can everybody hear me? Is there anyone here? This is one of those surprise lives that I mentioned might be happening while I was in Rexburg. And I am in Rexburg right now. I am with Megan Connor. Many of you might recognize her. She is a friend of the program, a guest of the program. She is also Lori Vallow Daybell's cousin and someone that I have interviewed before. And we have remained in touch. Megan and I have continued talking. I, I would call you a friend now. Maybe that's not very professional, but <laughs> um, I really appreciate Megan a lot. And uh, we've been talking. Hey, Steph Budge, we have been talking about Lori Vallow Daybell's sentencing coming up, of course. Um, again, I just made it to Idaho. I, I told Megan, as soon as I can get checked into my room, um, I wanted to, to go live with you again. Many people have asked for you to come back on our show, Megan. And, uh, we've so appreciated the introspective view you brought us into who your cousin is, the family system you came from. Um, and a little bit more about the Cox family. Uh, and since your interview, we have had your Uncle Rex on our show, as well as your cousin, Adam. And I know that you are happy to see them uh, come forward. I, I talked to you actually right before we interviewed them, and you were quite excited to hear from them. Um, so although I did say to them, and I, I don't even know if you, I think you watched the whole interview. Is that right? Yeah, I did. Yeah. I did ask them about your interview. Um it sounds like they hadn't listened to the whole thing yet, <laughs> um, but uh, they had nothing to to argue. In other words, that's how I took it. But thank you for being on here again. The reason I wanted to invite you on is because of what is going to happen in just a few days. And I wanted to check up on you. Um, I know because of private conversations and the texts we're having too, it's pretty heavy coming up Monday. How are you feeling? How are you doing? I feel pretty good, actually. I think the I think the um, the verdict was very heavy for me emotionally, but this feels uh, this feels a little less heavy, just because now it's it's just a matter of time, timing, you know, as far as how much time she's going to get at this point. Um, I do want to say I do really want to just say thank you. First of all, you and Dr. John have been amazing and it's been wonderful to connect with you guys and talk with you guys and your community of people here is just amazing. I've had I've had so many lovely comments and lots of people have visited my website and bought my book and even um, a couple of people have signed up for coaching with me. Um, that that belong to your community. And they're just wonderful people. I just love your people. So I'm really grateful to be connected to everybody because it, it's, it, it is a very lonely place to kind of be the truth teller in a family like this. <laughs> a truth teller is a good term. And first off, thank you for that incredible compliment. Um, there's nothing that makes me more proud. There's a reason why we call um, our listeners and viewers our gems, our hidden gems, because it, they are truly the best thing um, that have come out of our channel and our podcast. So thank yeah. you. That's so good to hear. Um, and, and you know what Megan, when we'll talk about it in a little bit, but Megan does have a book um, where she shares a lot more. We mentioned it in your interview, but we'll definitely share a link again to your book and, and everything else. Thank you. That's yeah, I think last time the link stopped working for some reason, there were a lot of comments from people that said, I can't, the link isn't working. I, I talk to my website people and it should be, it should be all up and running and working fine now. <laughs> yeah. The, the verdict is heavy. Um, you were considering coming to the sentencing. You've decided against it. Uh, you might take a little bit of time off though. I hear is that. Yeah. I'm, I'm taking the day off of work. I really want to make sure that I, I want to hear everything. I want to hear the victim impact statements, especially it's really important to me to hear that. And um, I, I don't know how I'm going to feel or how emotional I'm going to be. And so I just have decided to just take a day and, um, you know, just do, do some self-care and, and to, you know, sort of listen to this final chapter of this part of this, of the story. Yeah. Um, I, I shared that it was your uncle 
Rex, Uncle Rex, but many people are asking if Rex is your dad. Do you want to explain how you are related to Rex and to Adam? Yeah, so Rex is my dad's brother. So um, Rex is my dad's younger brother. And so he's my uncle. And um, then Adam is my cousin, of course, since Lori and he are siblings. So Adam is also my first cousin. Okay. After you gave the interview here, you also gave one at uh, Mormon Stories, which I recommend everyone listening to you, uh, listening to your interview over there. In fact, you you gave a little bit more over there. In fact, it was uh, middle of the interview with John DeLynn. You, you said, I'm sorry, Lauren, I'm going to tell them this. <laughs> but I did not care. I thought, this is wonderful. I, I took that as you feeling braver to share your voice and your truth, if that makes sense. Yeah, it was, it was really, you know, I, I wanted to be respectful of, um, you know, Melanie, who is Stacy's daughter. And um, I didn't know how my sharing the details of that story would affect her. And so um, I wanted to be respectful of that. Um, I did not get a chance to, you know, to talk with anybody between your interview and the Mormon Stories interview. But the more that I thought about it, um, I just realized that that was a big, it, it was a big connection for a lot of people to realize that this dysfunction has been going on for a long time. And it's, um, I was, you know, other, other than Alex, I was the only one who was there and Alex is gone now. So I felt like that was important to, you know, to say what happened as, as the only person who really witnessed those events. Yeah. And you were, you were the only, the only one. And Alex is deceased and the rest of the family was out of town. So you yeah. really truly are at this time, the only person that can share that. So thank you. Yeah. I like what Kay Louise says. Truth tellers may not be popular, but they are health healthier. And we th are thankful for you. Um, yeah. It, well, and it's true. It's true. I think um, you, uh, I'll say you and, and Heather Daybell, I think are the truth tellers that we've had here. Uh, give us an insight unlike anyone else. So I thank you for sharing what you shared with us because it's helped us to make sense of the crimes. And that's, that sounds strange to say by learning about the Cox family, it's helping us to make sense of the crimes, but it does. It does. Um, how something like this can happen. That's what hidden true crime is about, the hidden motives. Uh, a lot of people are asking about victim impact statements from Colby and Summer, I've, I've heard a few things myself, but have you heard anything from your end? Um, I haven't. Um, I, I did, I don't, I don't have Colby's contact information, but I did um, tell a family member that I, I definitely would love to be in touch with him if he, if he's willing. Um, I have a lot of compassion for him. And I think out of anybody who is living, um, he has lost the most in this situation. And I really feel a great deal of heartbreak for him and, um, you know, would love to be a resource of whatever he would possibly need help and healing and whatever he needs. Um, but I haven't, I haven't been able to be in touch with him yet. Um, and I did reach out to Summer. I texted her after her testimony in court. Um, I didn't hear back from her, which is completely understandable. Um, I know she's, there, I'm, I'm sure she must be feeling a huge range of emotions and I know it's a lot to process and to deal with. So I don't, you know, I don't blame anybody for not adding another layer to all of that. So that's, that's very understanding. And you were really close to, to summer growing up. Um, let's also, when, when it comes to lives, we have a rule here at Hidden True Crime. We did this with Vicki Hoban, Tammy, Tammy Daybell's aunt, because you're live. If there's something I ask and you don't want to answer it because I don't have editing capability, you simply say, I, I don't want to talk about that. Yeah. We, we sort of set that stage before we went live, but I'll just <laughs> say it here. That's sort of my yeah. rule with live interviews. Um, I'll ask and you can answer or not. Um, are you in, can I ask if you're in touch with any Cox family members, especially after your interview. I, we can even maybe even call it a tell all interview. In some ways. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. I mean, like I said, I, I reached out to Summer. I, I also reached out to Rex after I saw his interviews at the courthouse and, um, you know, told him I was, I was glad that he was there with his girls and that he was doing that. And I didn't hear back from him either, which is fine. Um, I know they were traveling and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, I tried to get together with Adam last time I was in St. George and it ended timing ended up not working out. Um, but so I, I really haven't been in touch with, um, you know, with any of the, of the other family members. And I understand too, that given number one, the things that I shared in my interviews and number two, the fact that I've left the LDS church may have, it, it may just be problematic for, for family members not knowing what to say or how to connect or whatever. So um, I don't I don't blame anybody for not responding and for kind of keeping their distance from me. It's it's to be expected in, in some ways. The, in other words, there's so much there's trauma in this family and mm -hmm. you understand that is yeah. that is very understanding and very compassionate. Um, I will say though, I I've had um, a, some unexpected contact with with not only family family members, but other people who've reached out after my interviews, um, former members of my ward, people that I knew that were friends with my parents, um, and and a couple of family members that I didn't ever expect to hear from again. So there there have been some really um, interesting reconnections and um, a lot of just a lot of compassion from people. So I've been really appreciative of that. Okay. Um, what, you know, when, it, so, so, oh, to, for people that are asking, Kay Woodcock is going to give a victim impact statement. Yes, she is. Larry was not allowed to. And we also know that Vicki Hoban is going to give a victim impact statement. And, um, I just read and po pinned it that someone said Annie Cushing might have entered an emergency request to speak, um, which if that's the case is, is very interesting. And I think she'd have a, a, a good chance to do that. Mm -hmm. um, when, and maybe you don't know, but what is, what are you most nervous about when it comes, are you going to be watching the sentencing? Are you going to be live streaming? Yeah, yeah, I am. I think you're doing a live stream of it, right? Yes. On your yeah, channel. We'll so I, I'm, I'll be watching along with all the other hidden gems. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll be watching um, with you. We'll be yeah. watching with you. Um, and, and anything you're most nervous about or anything that well, worries you the most? Um, I don't think I'm, I'm definitely not as nervous about this as I was about the verdict. Um, I don't have any speculation about how I think it's going to go. I really think it's just, you know, whether whether the time comes from from this specific sentencing or whether her court case in Arizona, whatever happens with that, I don't think that it's likely that uh, Lori will leave prison. And so I'm grateful for that. And I, but I but that's kind of what I'm anticipating. And if it's if it's anything less than that, if for some reason there's some kind of leniency and she gets minimum sentencing, I think that I would be very nervous about that. But I, I'm also looking forward to, you know, what happens with her Arizona trial as well. And right. I think that's just going to, and I don't know what the circumstances are there. Probably some of you know better than I do about whether the death penalty is on the table in Arizona, what she's being specifically charged with and what the possible sentencing is for that. I don't know. Um, but my hope is that between this verdict and that verdict, that she will be in prison for the rest of her life. That's my hope. Yeah. I, I'm going to suspect that she will get life. And this is a prediction for me. Um, this is, I don't know what judge Boyce will do, but I, I want to say that, um, you know, the death penalty was on the table originally in this case. And I believe that judge Boyce's hands were tied a bit when, um, when people, when Lori did not waive her right to a speedy trial, Put a pin in that, by the way. That's something I want to ask you about, um, her decision to not waive that right. And uh, they did not have the evidence to the defense in time uh, for it to really be a just thing. You know, they, they, you, you can't waste, you know, somebody's life is 
a punishment and you don't even have the information to uh, to try her justly. It's it's difficult to put the death penalty on the table. So Judge Boyce removed that. And I feel like in some in some ways he had no choice. But because of that, I do believe in my personal opinion that we might see life. And as you point out as well, uh, Arizona is that, that we haven't even gone to Arizona. You know, up next is Chad, but maybe up next is Lori in Arizona. We don't even right. know what's going to happen there. Right. Um, I do have a question about her. Uh, she was, Lori was always adamant about not waiving her right to a speedy trial, as well as being uh, very adamant about not taking a plea deal. I do believe plea deals were discussed and negotiated, and that is not something she did. Do you have any insight into that is i know that barry practiced law or some law or he likes the law he doesn't i hear that i don't maybe you can explain that <laughs> we're too. gonna say that very loosely because he i don't think he ever um had an actual law license but he did like to practice law <laughs> right yeah yeah so so barry liked to practice law without a law license and he was interested in the law um Lori was really adamant about those two things any any idea as to why well, I mean, it's it's going to be speculation. I, I think some of that is legal strategy, and maybe that was um, a, an advice from her attorneys um, as far as what uh, as far as what what would be most advantageous to her case. So I can only speculate about that. I will say when I talked with the mitigation specialist, um, this was prior to the death penalty being taken off the table. And so what she and I had a long conversation about, um, about the possibility of the death penalty. And I have, you know, I have a lot of mixed feelings about that um, in general, the death penalty in general, but it's specifically for somebody that you, somebody that I previously loved and who was a part of my life and then taking into account how how far she turned and that she was capable of, of this kind of horror inflicted on her own children. I just, it's just still, even with all of the work that I've done and even with all the processing that I've done is still unfathomable to me. And so um, as far as the death penalty goes, you know, I, I can't say, um, if the legal strategy sort of played into that to try and get that taken off the table and, and whatever. And, and that's their, her attorney's job is to protect her from the death penalty. And, and beyond that, when you're representing a client who's pretty obviously guilty, um, you know, it's, I can't imagine what that must be like as an attorney to have to go through that. So I'm sure they just, they used whatever strategies they could. And I've said before too, that um, a lot of the things that the attorneys have done and are doing, you know, people will will question that and, and say, why in the world would they do that? Well, it's a huge part of it is to make sure that there's no basis for appeal due to bad representation by the by the legal team. So they have to do everything in their power to get the best result for Lori. And, and I think that's maybe the speedy trial had had to do with that. Okay. Okay. Thank you for sharing um, that, your, your thoughts on that. You know, since we spoke, um, your interview, by the way, has been watched by hundreds of thousands. I don't know if you ever thought it would be watched by so many. No, I, I spoke to Heather, actually. <laughs> I want to say Heather Daybell picked me up from the airport today. It was so kind. My friend Heather, the other truth teller. And she said the same thing. She never expected her email to get so many her email why did i say email her interview to get so many views and i think it's similar to um you know, i don't sometimes think these truth tellers realize how valuable they are but back to what i was saying since you you gave your interview and hundreds of thousands of people have watched your interview um a lot's happened including the verdict we already talked about the verdict but your uncle and your cousin also came forward with uh, podcast. We also touched on that a bit, but was, has there been anything you've listened or heard from their podcast um, 
that was interesting to you? I know that they, you know, they, they brought you up recently. I don't know if that's something you want to talk about. Um, but any thoughts on their podcast? Yeah. Oh, well, I'm, I'm glad they're doing it because I, I know that, that they both have said that it's a way for them to process and it, and talking about it does help um, those of us who are trying to process it. And I, I'm glad that they're trying to find, as they call it, silver linings in, in a terrible situation. I think that's, that's an important thing for all of us to do is to kind of look at this and say, what have we learned and what are we going to do differently in our families, our relationships, our communication, you know, um, to make the world a healthier place um, for people. And I'm, so I'm grateful that that's what they're doing. Um, I was a little disappointed in their episode on Stacy because I was hoping that by that time they would have listened to at least one or the other of my interviews, or at least the part about Stacy, um, because I was really interested in um, their perspective, especially Adam's perspective, um, because I wanted to know what was going on in the immediate family. And I know that Adam was not, he was not in Hawaii with everybody else, but I was really interested to hear, like, did, did, did his family contact him? Did he hear about the um, medical reports that were coming out? Was he aware of everything that was being talked about, speculated about? Um, so I, I was disappointed that we didn't get any of that information. And maybe at some point they will listen to my story and have some comments about that. So that, that's the main thing. Um, the episode they released today, I did, I thought was really, it was really the first one that I felt like was, was interesting to me anyway, because, um, it was good to know what was going on with Adam in those, those days after Charles was killed and, and how he was dealing with that and how he was feeling. I felt like that was, um, kind of the first information that I wasn't aware of before that was a little bit more um, in introspective into how he was feeling after that and what he went through, what he and his son went through afterwards. So I did appreciate that. I'm, you know, I've, of course, I'm going to listen to all the episodes. I'm glad they're doing it. Um, you know, I hope that it's helpful for them and for other people. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah. I know that therapy has been really important to you and they refer to mental health a lot in their podcast. Uh, you said one thing, and I want to ask you that they didn't bring up any medical reports about Stacy. Do you know of any anything more about any medical reports or what was being brought? Well, what what there? I was always confused about, even at the time, was that um, there was some speculation that Stacy had done something to hurt herself, and. Um, I remember hearing some talk about there being alcohol in her system. And since then, I've actually, some of your gems have been really helpful to, to send me messages and stuff. And I think there was a nurse who, who contacted me and said that um, sometimes DKA can present as, as alcohol in the system. And, and so that, that was helpful. That helped clear that up. But what I was interested in is when she, when she was admitted to the hospital, between the time she was admitted to the hospital and the time that she was transferred to hospice care, like what were the doctors saying? And did, you know, did Adam have any information about that? You know, I'm sure that the doctors contacted her parents, or, or at least I would think that they would have. And I know my parents were there. My dad doesn't have a super great recollection about exactly what went on there. So I just would be interested to hear that from, you know, what were the doctors saying? What was the prognosis? Was it immediately evident that she was not going to recover? Those kinds yeah. of things would be, you know, interesting to know. Yeah. And helpful for you to process your own experience. Again, you were there, you saw her, you, you took her to the hospital for you to be able to process what happened there to your beloved cousin. I can imagine. Yeah. Um, Just to clarify really though, I didn't actually take her to the hospital. She went in an ambulance and That's Alex true. and I followed in a car after afterwards. Thank you for clarifying that. That is an important detail and I want to get the facts straight here. So thank you for clarifying yeah. everything that you do. Um, you know, so, so you're going to be watching it here. Um, do you have any, do you feel anything when you see Lori in her, you know, she's, she doesn't look like the, the cousin you used to know um, because I think, 
you know, clearly she's in prison. She doesn't get to pick her own clothes. She can't get her hair done. She doesn't have the makeup, you know, that's, um, is it hard for you to see her in the situation she's in now? It, it is, it is hard in a lot of ways because, you know, that's, it's, it's devastating to, to see a family member in, in that situation. And, and I mean, she's obviously there because of her own actions and she deserves to be there, but it's, it's also, it's also just very sad. You know, there's a lot, I have a lot of grief over this whole situation and I grieve for losing her as much as, you know, as grief for the victims as well, because, you know, she, she is not, um, she's not the same person that she was. Although I do have to say that the, the little glimpses that I have seen of her coming in and out of court, I mean, it, it is the still the bubbly personality of Lori is still in there, you know, sort of the parading hair flipping, you know, smiling at everybody that that's, you know, that's Lori. And you, you know, you say she, she doesn't have makeup. She can't get her hair done, but she's obviously, you know, getting makeup at the commissary or trading or something like that. And she's obviously doing like the prison type of hairstyle, which I've heard a couple people comment that they like roll up toilet paper rolls to curl their hair and stuff. She's obviously still doing her hair. I mean, that's Lori's always going to do her hair. It doesn't matter. Right. You know? Whatever she needs to do. Yeah, yeah. Whatever she's capable of doing. Yeah. So she might I mean, not have the curling iron and the bleach, but she has <laughs> the braids and the, the curls. Yeah. yeah. And it's, I mean, I don't want to make light of, of anything in here, but you know, it's, it, you, I do just have to see those little glimpses of, you know, there's, there's a bright spot in there that like, that is, that is Lori. That's her personality. It's how she's always been. And I, I do see that in her every time she comes in and out of the courtroom. Um, I haven't, I haven't been vigilant and watched her as, as much as your community has. And, and certainly you were in court, in the courtroom with her. Um, and I know there have been, of course, you know, changes in her demeanor and things like that. And I think that's really, it's part of why I decided not to go to the sentencing because I don't really, it, I know it's a small room. I know there's not very much space. Um, I know Rex talked about making eye contact with her and it's just not something that I need or want to do, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for, for those, by the way, as I continue talking to Megan, I saw a couple of questions come down. If anybody has any questions for Megan, put a big old question mark in your comment and, and I'll scan them and see them. And uh, uh, perhaps we'll ask them if anybody has any questions. I want to share. Um, so one thing you said, so a couple of things. Um, First off, Salty Sleuth, True Crime Time, says, I follow this case from day one. Why does nobody speak of the religious teachings? They prefer, prepare for zombies. It's on the website. Oh, my goodness. You came to the right channel. It's <laughs> all re <laughs> we talk so much about this, and, um, and Megan and I talk about this in private, too. In fact, we're considering um, some podcasts that are in the works about some of the religion. But you also, I also noticed, Megan, that you said, that she's changed, that Lori has changed. Someone asked earlier um, how she's changed or when you started seeing changes. I know it's been years since you've seen her, but um, I want to get to that religious aspect in just a second. So we'll come back to that. But right now, what, where has your cousin changed the most? Well, I mean aside from the obvious fact that, you know, that she, obviously she got to a point where she felt like it was okay to murder people, you know, that, um, that's something that, that of course, none of us want to believe that the people that we love are capable of that. And so, you know, looking back on our time together and everything, um, and I just was realizing today that it's been, it's been 30 years, almost, almost to the day since I left the apartment in Austin <laughs> after living with Lori. Um, it's wild wow. to me that it's been that much time. Um, but you know, that, that part of it is, is still just so incredibly difficult to, to reconcile in, in my brain that, that we're, you know, we, we got to this point, but I do think that understanding the religious teachings and 
how Chad Daybell played into all of this helps me understand how she got to that point from where she was before, you know? And so I think um, that when, when did she start changing? You know, when I started hearing about her going to the temple every single day, that was a, that was a shock to me um, because I know she had been, she'd been active in the church. She'd been involved but she never struck me as the type of person who was devout, if that makes sense, or devout yeah. enough to go every single day. I mean, at my at my you know peak devotion to the church, I was going to the temple once a week, and that felt like wow. a lot <laughs> to me. And that is a lot too. I want people to know when. It, so when and to clarify for people that are not LDS, a lot of people think the temple is the Sunday worship service, and it is not. Church on Sunday is different than attending the temple. So everybody goes every Sunday to church, but the temple is a place you can go Tuesday through Saturday to uh, feel close to the Lord, to um, do ordinances and work for the dead. Am I explaining it? Okay, Megan. Yeah. I'm looking I, and, to you for reassurance. <laughs> yeah. And it, and I, it, it may be helpful for people to know that, um, you know, the, the temple is a, it's a more sacred place than a regular meeting house. And you have to, you have to literally be a card carrying Mormon to get into the temple. You have to go through an inter interview process to go to the temple. You have to interview with your bishop, who is the leader of your congregation. And then there's a, a higher level of person called a stake president, who is the leader over several congregations. And you have to pass an interview with both of those people in order to get the card that allows you to get into the temple. And you have to show your card when you go. Um, the last time I went through the interview process, it was your card was good for two years. Is that still the case, do you think? I, I haven't heard it change unless it's just a year. But yeah, yeah I heard it was two years. Yeah. And so, you know, so being able to go to the temple is not just Mormonism. It's like the next level of Mormonism kind of, and it, it's an expectation that everybody sort of strives to get to that point where you're, where you're worthy to go into the temple. And I know that the leaders of the church have kind of asked people to attend the temple once a month um, if they can, if they're able to. And when you go to the temple, it's about a two hour ceremony that you go through. And um, so it's a, it's a, so it's a big time commitment, you know? And so to hear that Lori was going to the temple every single day and doing multiple ceremonies every day, I think Adam said in the po podcast that she was going for four or five or six hours a day at some point. So that crosses sort of a line into religious zealotry. That is, you know, very, um, that's very unusual. I don't, think I've ever heard of anybody doing that much temple attendance. I, I have never heard of it. I actually have, you know, I'm impressed with your once a week. Um, the most I've heard someone go is about once a month. Some people go once a year. Uh, it also takes all day. It's a big, it's a big event. It's a sacrifice. It also means that she's not with her children because children do not attend with the adults. Um, yeah, I agree. So thanks for explaining that. Uh, we're getting, a, I, I suggested people, our gems ask you questions and questions are coming. Um, I don't know if you can see the comments, but if there's ever a, a question you want to answer, let me know. How has the crime affected the family dynamics? I mean, you haven't talked to a lot of people recently. Right. Um, but I do, uh, from what I understand, um, Janice, who is Lori's mom, does meet with her once a week. Um, and they do not discuss the case, um, but they, you know, she is in touch. Um, I think there is still a lot of division in the family. I think there's still a lot of hurt feelings over, you know, t people who took sides early on and things like that. Um, there is still sort of this lingering um, understanding from I mean, I'll just say I, I have been in touch with a family member who has told me that um, that Summer and Janice watch all the interviews and they read every single comment and they have a lot of strong feelings about the things that are being said, um, which is understandable. You know, it's people are talking about them and people are sharing details about their lives. And 
Um, I understand them not wanting to necessarily expose themselves in public to try to sort of explain things or make people understand. I mean, I, I get that. I don't, I'm not expecting either one of them to come forward and say more than they've already said. And um, it's got to be an incredibly tough place to be. Um, but I just know that, I know that, um, that healing is really possible with communication and understanding and and I've had some conversations with one of my family members. Like I said, I didn't ever expect to hear from them again and heard from them. And, and we both have been able to sort of approach our relationship from a, in a place of mutual understanding of I'm trying to understand this person. They're trying to understand me. And we're able to communicate about that. And I think that's where healing takes place. I, I wish that more of that would take place in our family. Thank you. You have, you know you are very introspective megan that's i i tell you that often um in a in a world where you know i think in general people just do not have as much self-awareness as you have were you you know always so self-aware i can't imagine you were because you talk about the family system and that's not knowing about the family system and then learning about the family system can i ask you what happened for you to start to see the family differently, to, to see something that you didn't see before. Yeah. Because I think that a lot of us lack self-awareness. We don't know what we don't know, you know, and how did this happen? How, how did you get here? How did you? Well, I talk a lot about this in my book. Um, and I will, I, I will just kind of briefly, briefly say that when um, I, I had been through so much trauma in my young life, and I just was sort of on this path of what people expected me to do. And, and in the LDS faith, there's a lot of expectations of boxes that you need to check and things you need to do. And so I was trying to do that as much as I could. And I sort of just put blinders on and was just on that track, trying to do the things that, that, you know, that other people told me were the right things for me to do in my life. And, um, I, it's so funny because my siblings and I would get together and we would say, yeah, I mean, you know, we had a pretty normal childhood, you know, none of us got along great with our parents, but it, it's not like it was, you know, abusive or anything, you know, and we just would, we would talk about how we pretty much had normal growing up, but, but we had some weird feelings about certain things and just went, ah, oh, well, you know, just didn't really dig into it. And then, the um, yeah, yeah, just go with the flow, just go along to get along um, and not talk about things that, that were painful. And then, um, probably about seven or eight years ago, um, my dad wanted to have a conversation with me about what kind of father he was and like how things had been in our childhood. And my reaction was like, Nope, sure. Don't want to have that talk. I really don't No, Thank you. I, we're, you know what? We're good. I'm out of the house. I'm an adult. I have my own life. Like, let's just leave the past in the past kind of thing. Um, we did end up having that conversation though. And it, it, it forced me back into reality to, to really confront my real feelings about things. And it brought up a lot of stuff that I had just dissociated from and, and repressed and did not want to ever think about or talk about again. Yeah. But it ended up being really great because um, <laughs> this is going to sound sort of weird, but I, after that conversation, I started having panic attacks all the time. Um, especially it, when I had to um, go to my parents' house or when I had to go to church, there were things started triggering me physically. And I, okay. if things had not started triggering me physically, I don't know that I would have ever kind of snapped out of it because I couldn't function. I was depressed. I couldn't get out of bed. Um, you know, I was trying to be a mom and a teacher and, you know, go through my life. And I just couldn't do it anymore because I was I was incapacitated. So I finally decided to to reach out to a therapist and get help. And um, so I did talk therapy for almost four years. And then wow. um, we got to sort of a stopping point where my therapist said, you know, I just I think you're good. Um, you probably have some trauma that you haven't uncovered, but you'll just you'll have triggers for the rest of your life. But you know how to manage them now and you're going to be OK. And I left that session. I went, absolutely not. I do not want to live my life like that. And so I started researching trauma therapies and I ended up finding um, EMDR counseling. Wow. 
And when I started to do that, my life completely changed. Um, I, it was like, I mean, I, I had a lot of traumatic things that I had to address, but after uh, about 18 months of EMDR, I was a completely different person. You know, I just was, I was able to see things in a much different way and stop being traumatized by the people and the events in my life. And I started at that point, removing everything from my life that felt abusive or oppressive. And so I, I just started drawing some really healthy boundaries. I got divorced. I left the church. I quit teaching, <laughs> you know, um, really just, drastic changes, changed yeah, everything. Yeah. So over the last, um, really five years, I, my life is completely different than it was five years ago. And it, and I've never been happier. I just am, I'm loving so much the person that I'm becoming and I'm, I'm loving the people that I have in my life. And I'm just, I'm just so happy. <laughs> I didn't, and I didn't think I ever would be happy. And that's, that's the miracle of it. You know, one person that doesn't have a lot of self-awareness and is, I, I believe, disassociating each and every day is your cousin, Lori. Yeah. It's so interesting to talk to you. And people mention, you know, you look like Lori, you have blonde hair. And um, I actually think you guys sound very different, but yes, you know, you, your cousins and to hear you talk with such insight and then to see Lori in court who, who hasn't shown any grief or any, there's been no confession. This is a case without a confession who seems to stand by still what she did and stand by Chad. Um, I don't even, I don't even know what my question is. I guess I'm just processing it with you. Like it's just shows me what hard work can do. I get, here's my question. Do you think she'll ever get to a place where she can see what she did, where she can stop disassociating? And see her I, friends. That that is my greatest hope. And and I can see David's question down here. If I could address the court and Lori, what what would I say? I would hope I would never have to address the court because I, I don't. That would be crazy to me. But when Lori was in Rexburg, um, uh, there were a couple of times I was in Rexburg because I was visiting my daughter who lived there at the time, and I I wanted to go to the prison and talk to her. And I actually signed up for an account to get on her schedule and. I scheduled an appointment and it went through. So I was like excited that maybe I would get to talk to her and then it ended up getting canceled and I don't know why. So, but, but that is the one thing that I would say is that I, I completely understand people who do not want to dig in and do the work to heal from traumatic experiences because it is really, really difficult. It is painful. Um, I don't think it's as painful as the trauma that you went through in the first place, but it is painful. It is difficult. And it is, it, it does require a lot of work and a lot of dedication. Um, and I don't know if Lori will ever get to that point, but I hope that she does. That is my greatest hope is that at some point something will get through to her and she will be able to address the pain in her own life that, led her to cause so much pain to other people. And that's really, I think my message to the entire world and the reason that I wrote my book and the reason that I'm doing coaching and the reason I'm doing these interviews is because I want people to understand that when you don't heal from whatever it is that happened in your life, whether it's something very traumatic or whether it's something as simple as unmet emotional needs, which isn't real. I shouldn't say that's simple because it's not, but, um, if you don't do the work to fix that, you are going to hurt people in some way. And well, I think sure. my my greatest, I, I don't know, I guess the mantra for my life sort of became that I never want to hurt anyone the way that I was hurt. And I think there is a choice there that happens. I think that perhaps the choice that Lori made, and this is total speculation because I don't know, but it seems like the choice that she made is that she said, I'm never going to let anybody hurt me the way that I was hurt in the past. And she sort of built up this wall and this delusion, and that's where she's been living. And so my hope for her is that there will be something at some point that breaks through and that she will be able to, you know, get the help that she needs to work through all of that. 
Thank you. A lot of people continue to ask about Janice and Barry. Um, you know, and I, you're, I've heard the same thing that you shared, that Janice does talk to Lori, uh, but they don't talk about the crimes necessarily or um, any. They, they stick to kind of just the basic conversations about how mm -hmm. they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but neither Janice or Barry came to the trial. Um, I don't believe they're coming to the sentencing. Do you have have any idea how they might be coping now or, um, you know, rec even, even Barry in particularly? Um, of course I don't, I don't have any idea. I can't imagine though, putting myself in Janice's shoes as a mother, what that must be like for her. And I, I have a huge amount of compassion for her because it's got to be incredibly painful for her to face this situation. And, um, you know, and, and as moms, you know, a lot of us, our initial reaction is, is going to be guilt about like, what should I have done or could I have done differently? And, and all of that kind of stuff. I'm sure she must be feeling some of that because we all, all of us mothers do that, whether it's right or wrong, you know, um, hopefully she gets to the place where she realizes that, you know, your kids, obviously you can, you can do a perfect job raising them and they can still turn out terribly um, because they are who they are when they, when they come to us. And, you know, all we can do is to do our best to be a good influence on them. Um, but I'm, I'm sure she must be going through just an incredible amount of pain. And I'm sure that Barry too, like as a father, um, you know, for your daughter to get to this point and they've, they've lost three children now. I mean, they have. you know, four children really with Lolly yes. and it, and that's gotta be incredibly painful. I mean, no, no parent should have to, to endure that kind of pain. Um, and, and regardless of how, how everybody in the world feels about what contributions they may have made to, to this situation and, and how they may have some culpability on it. Um, I, I hope that people, approach it with at least some amount of compassion to realize how, how difficult this must be. And, you know, it, if it were, if it were you, would you, would you go show up in public for people to throw rotten tomatoes at you and tell you you're a horrible person? You know, I can't, no, I can't imagine. Right. Yeah. That is something that hidden true crime is against. You know, we do not think that's ever the answer. B Gentry asks, uh, if you still think it was that Lori was right to do what she did, I want to take that a step further and ask, do you think she still believes, do you think she believes all these beliefs that she created? Um, that? Rex made a comment in one of their podcasts about um, how Lori is still in her delusion. I think he said that's, that's why, um, that's why she and Janice, Lori and Janice don't talk about the case is because she's still in her delusion. I wish Rex would expound on that because I think he's probably had some conversations with Janice and he may know a little bit better. But I think that we can make the assumption that as long as Lori is wearing that facade where she's not showing emotion and she's not showing grief, then she probably does still feel like she was doing God's work and, you know, believes what she believes about herself and her role and all yeah. this. You know, John and I actually recorded a Patreon uh, episode last night, patreon.com slash hidden true crime for bonus episodes. And we recorded one right before we left. And I asked him, I was talking to him about Lori's belief system. And so often, I just want to share this. So often we talk about how if we're saying that Lori believes all this, we're excusing the crime somehow. And I actually want to say it's, it becomes more concerning to me because it shows a risk to reoffend. It shows a lack of remorse. It shows a woman who can't face reality. And that's sad in order to heal, as you pointed out, it's painful, but you must face reality. Um, you know, I just, I guess want to say that the, um, because, or it, you know, she still believes her risk assessment, if she was being assessed for recidivism in the community by a 
forensic psychologist, it actually goes up. It's concerning. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it will make Judge Boyce, I suspect, be harsher with his sentencing. Yeah, I would agree with that. And, and I would think that if there had been an attempt on her part to, um, you know, to address her delusion and to, and to um, you know, get some help if she was reaching out for mental health treatment and things like that, um, maybe it would have uh, created some leniency. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think you're right that it, it is absolutely a, a huge risk for reoffending if she's if she's still in in that delusion. And it is really disturbing um, that it can go that far and stay for this long. Yeah. You and I have talked about some of the belief systems in detail, uh, specific ones. Uh, I've done quite a few um, episodes on the belief systems uh, found in this group of like-minded prepping friends. Um, including your cousin and Chad Daybell and Melanie Gibb and David Warwick and Zulema. Um, one thing we've talked about, and, and we're going to talk about this more in detail, perhaps even on Mormon Stories and um, on our podcast later, but a book called Visions of Glory. And you've been reading this book recently. I've been reading it again for a bit. And while we're not going to delve in too deep now, because Megan and I are planning an episode for later um, about this book, because we believe it's so important. Do you want to share like how, well, first off, let's, yeah. What do you want to share just briefly about the book? What we've discussed, how you yeah. think it plays a part in her belief system. Um, I will just briefly say that I, I read this book back when I was um, fully devoted to the LDS church um, back when it first came out, I think 2014 or 2015, I'm not sure exactly when it was published, but that's when I read it. And it was around this time when there was a lot of fervor and discussion in our family, as well as in my local church community about near death experiences. And I, at that time had written, uh, read, not written, but read probably four or five near-death experience books at that point. And somebody in my congregation handed me a copy of Visions of Glory and said, I think you're going to find this really interesting. Because at the time I was teaching gospel doctrine class, which is for those who aren't members, it's sort of, it's a deep dive into the doctrine where we study the scriptures and the church history and everything. So uh, we had had a lesson about, um, you know, the book of Revelation, the signs of, of the end, end times and everything. And I did this huge disclaimer at the beginning where I said, you know, um, we're not going to talk about speculation. We're just going to stick to the scriptures and we're only going to talk about, you know, the, the actual teachings in the scriptures about the end of days. And this person came up to me afterwards and handed me a book in a manila envelope and said, I think you're going to find this really interesting. There's a lot of information in here. And as a true believing member, I read it and was fascinated by it. And I thought it was so interesting. And I gave it some credence because it was written sort of quote unquote anonymously. Right. Um, anyway, quote that's all yeah. I'll say about, about that for now. But I will say that um, when you made the suggestion, Lauren, to go back and, and look at it again, um, I it, it, it's very interesting now reading it again, being out of the church at this point. And um it's pretty wild and horrifying in a lot of ways to tie it together with what Lori and Chad were teaching. And um, yes. a family member told me that she, she would quote scripture that Lori would quote scripture, but she also used that book as a reference book and she would quote from it and she would, you know, mark it up and highlight it and all of that kind of stuff. So it's going to be really interesting to dive into it. And I, and I can definitely say that understanding that book, from both of those perspectives, both in the church and out of the church, really helped me understand Lori and, and how this came to happen. So I think it's going to be one of the most important things that we've talked about. Yeah, this book, I agree, this book has not gotten enough attention. I have mentioned it in several podcasts. It's always brief. I always say they loved it. I've always said it played a part. We've had interviewees state that from our interviewee, Anna, to Suzanne Freeman, 
Uh, I shared about the Visions of Glory book in the uh, Crash Course podcast that I did uh, during the trial. And Chad actually mentions the book in his speech the day he meets Lori Vallow. He talks about the book. And then in addition to that, um, the book, you know, this book talks about portals, like portals, not just like tubes, like actual portals. It talks about tr translated v beans. It, 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 it is their belief system. And the book is for those that have seen the Hawaii footage of Lori being served papers in Hawaii to produce her children. She is reading this book. She is reading it poolside in Hawaii with Chad Daybell. It, it refers to um, getting younger. You know, we, we make fun of Lori for talking about getting younger with Zulema. And it is in this book. The author, his name is Tom Harrison. I'll say that anonymous. Um, but, and I guess he's not the author. It was a ghost writer. He's now deceased, as you point out, anonymous. John Pontius was the author. author. Yeah. yeah, the author, the ghost writer. But it is, the visions are from Tom Harrison, who is still alive. Anonymous, Spencer. And it discusses his wife dying very quickly because he had another mission in life reading Chad's books. I'll just say this reading Chad's books feels like I'm reading fan fiction when it comes to visions of glory. I feel like Chad Daybell creates fictional characters where he says they're real, but they're fictional that go through the story that Spencer wrote that Tom Harrison wrote. Is that a good way to say it? Megan. Yeah, I haven't read Chad's books, but I have read, you know, brief synopses discussions on them or whatever. So it does, it does parallel, you know, very closely. It seems like um, it's almost like if you, I, I don't know, LDS people may be familiar with the series, The Work and the Glory. And it's like they took this historical, these historical events and made fictional characters go through these historical events. It sort of does feel very similar to what you know, Chad's books have, have been what the synopses of their books have been, but yeah, it's, and, it, and I don't necessarily think it's a great idea for people to run out and go buy this book and support, <laughs> support this thing, because it's, I think, very dangerous and very harmful, but there are some like free platforms that you can read the book on. I think Scribd has it, um, and a couple of other places. So if you don't want to support the book, but you still want to look at it, there, there are places you can see it. Yeah. And listen to it even. Yeah. You can listen to it for free. Actually, if you just Google ebook um, or to listen to it, you'll be able to find where you can listen to it for free. So anyway, I want to say this. We're still reaching with uh, researching this book, which is why I have we have not done our podcast yet. Um, I but I think the most interesting thing is that Julie Rowe, and Chad Daybell knew Tom Harrison. And they were meeting with him. I've learned this from multiple sources. And that's something. So we're still researching. I'm still interviewing people. I'm still delving into this. But this book is out there and it is still popular among LDS audiences. And that's why it's important. Yeah. Me. And I, I think it I think it's really it, it is going to be an important episode for for us to pick this thing apart. And and I will say I, I've sort of finished my um, delve into it of the things that I think are important to talk about. And there is at least one huge, huge smoking gun that we need to talk about. But there there's a lot like everything that every crazy thing that you've heard Lori say, you can find it in this book somewhere. Yes, everything, everything. I agree with you. It, they just play it out. It's almost like they're taking visions of glory and they are playing it out like it's Dungeons and Dragons. That's yeah. how I see it. Yeah. Yes. Um, and, and yeah, we'll save some for our podcast. I was about to add more. You know, a lot of people just wanting to know um, similar questions. How is the family? How is everyone doing? How, you know, but um, I think, you know, you've, You've talked about everyone. I think I'm more interested in just how you are doing. Um, 
Have you ever written, um, Lori, or, or desire to? In um, I haven't. It's not something that actually crossed my mind. Um, but I may at some point. Um, I think you know. I think I've I've wanted to reach out to her and talk to her. But yeah, I may I may write to her. And to answer your question, um, you know, you and I kind of talked about this before. But I for I felt like for me that the verdict once the verdict was read, um, it closed a door for me really, um, on, on this whole thing, because I just, I wanted to see justice done. I wanted to see her be guilty. And of course I, I want to know what's going to happen at the sentencing. And I, and I want, I want her to be in jail for the rest of her life. Um, but I, I don't, I don't see myself really, um, following the rest of the trials and everything else closely. I'm not particularly interested in, in Chad's trial. I am interested in the outcome, but I don't need to know, you know, all of the details I think have been shared for the, for the most part. Um, if Chad does decide to be forthcoming and give some kind of a confession or tell us what actually did happen to the children, um, I've, of course I would be interested in that, but I don't necessarily think that's gonna happen because it, it would probably be, you know, it would not be, advantageous to his legal position unless they're going to give him some kind of a plea deal, which there's been speculation about that. Um, but I, I really see it as, um, you know, the closing of a door for me and uh, my partner, Samuel, who's, who's incredibly wise, um, really wants to see me put this behind me. You know, hmm. it's, it's been, it's been it's draining. Time. Yeah. It's been emotional. It's been draining, but I feel like I've really processed through just about everything. And um, it, it's time for it to be a distant memory in my life. Is there anything that's been the most traumatic that you can pinpoint? If not, it's okay. But do you feel like it's brought anything up in particular that's been more traumatic than something else? The day that the kids were found was the worst day, definitely. Um, I Yeah, I mean, that, that was... Um, that was a very difficult time for me and I did not handle it well. Um, I definitely, I had already at that point, I, I think that the time at which I gave up hope that they, that they would be found alive was when I heard that JJ's service dog had been sold. Um, I think at that point, I, I really gave up hope at that point. And I, and I went into my therapist that week and we, and processed, the death of the children because I, I felt like it was coming in, in, you know, it was on its way. And that was way back in, I want to say November of 2019. So um, it was a long time after that, before the kids were found, obviously, but that was the worst day. That was the hardest day. And um, I'm grateful that that, that that's behind me. I'm grateful that I wasn't in the courtroom to see the autopsy photos um, I have a lot of um, compassion for the people covering the case who had to sit through that because I'm sure that's not something you'll ever forget. Um, I can't imagine. I, I'm glad I wasn't there for that. Yeah. But um, yeah, and I, and I think that I, I'm always a a proponent of, of the truth, as you know. Like we've we've talked about this. The truth is the most important thing to me. So if we are able to find out what really happened to the to the children um, and and to know exactly the details of what happened. I want to know because I want to know the truth, but I'm OK also not knowing um, if that if that information never comes out, I'm still going to be able to put all of this behind me. Um, but yeah, that's where I am. Thank you for sharing that a closure in, in a sense to be yeah. able to understand. I'm very much the same way being a journalist. When something traumatic happens to me, I want to know facts. I want to know everything. Right. I want to know. Um, and I get very actually kind of businessy. Like when something traumatic happens with my little brother, you know, people know about my little brother's accident. I want yeah. to know everything. And I just get kind of professional. I don't know. It's weird, but it's how I cope kind of like, yeah, tell me what's going on. I want to know. I want to know. Yeah. Um, I, 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 um, I wish you could be here. You almost came, but I think you're being wise, staying away. Um, thank you for being here again. 
Um, tell us where we can find your book. So my website is third-verse.com and my social media also on Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok is actually at third underscore verse. <laughs> so it's a little bit of a difference. Um, people have kind of asked me about that. Like, what does that mean? And it's, um, I'm, a, I'm a musician and I felt like my childhood was my first verse and my marriage was my second verse. And this is my third verse. And I feel like for the first time in my life, I'm the one who's writing it. So. That's beautiful. And, and third spelled T H I R D not a three R D correct. Right. It's spelled out. I was curious too. Thank you for sharing that. And we'll put a link to Megan's book in the description of this video. Once this live is done as well. Again, I am here in Rexburg. Um, I, um, I am hoping and looking forward to going to the sentencing Monday morning. I have my nails done for JJ and Tylee and, um, yeah, I, I'm looking for a bit of closure myself, I think. And I want, I want to see this through and I, and I want to know, and I'm, thank you. So for those that are just arriving, we will be live streaming the sentencing here and, uh, and Megan, thank you for being here. And so we'll be watching it together as a community. It'll be Monday morning. I'll get a link up later today. I have not, I haven't told you this yet, Megan either. Oh, well, I did take a nap, but, uh, airplane lobby, a travel nap, but, um, I've not been to bed yet. I was up packing, you know, those nights before trips, right? Before traveling. So, um, I, I thank you for coming on here today and, being a part of this. And I thank everyone for being here tonight. Um, so Monday is the day, uh, we're thinking of Kay and Larry as well. Kay and Larry are on their way here to Rexburg. Um, our hearts go out to them. Kay will be able to give a victim impact statement. Unfortunately, Larry will not. And that's heartbreaking. So, um, thank you everyone for being here for JJ, Tylee and Tammy. And of course, Vicki will be giving a victim impact statement. Uh, Megan for now, and this is not going to be the last time you're on our channel. We gave a little bit of a, we gave a little bit of a sneak peek for another episode we're planning, but is there anything else you want to say or want to talk about? I'm just, I'm just so grateful for this community. You guys have been wonderful and, and it is truly, um, you know, a, a bright spot in a, in a dark time to have, um, people like, like you and like your hidden true crime community who, who just come together and want to support each other. And I've had, I've had nothing but kindness from your people and from you and John, it's just been, it's been a huge part of, of my healing and my, um, my faith in humanity restored. So I'm, I'm really grateful and thank you for continuing to include me. And, and I'm, you know, I'm here for you guys for, you know, for as long as you, it, you know, for whatever you need or want, I'm, I'm here. So. Yeah. Um, thank you. There's no greater compliment. There's no greater compliment. Um, thank you. We, you are, John and I always say once, uh, once a gem, always a gem, once part of our, uh, program, we're always here for you. So thank you. Uh, I'm glad we've been able to help and Thank you for helping us. You have helped us to make sense of so much. And um, we're grateful for the truth tellers out there and for people that can look and um, into themselves and be self-aware. Laura, thank you so much. Um, she's still wondering if you think Alex had a role in Stacy's death, oh, Laura yeah. North. Thank 100%. you, Laura. A hundred percent, she just yeah. said. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Thank you, Laura, for helping me see that. I apologize that the chat is going so fast. Yeah. If, if you, um, if you want more about Stacy's death, I do go in depth, um, it, on my Mormon stories interview. If you, if you want to go over there and see it. Um, but yeah, I, there's no question in my mind when I started to put the pieces together of what was happening. Um, you know, I did, I, I reached out to the FBI a couple of different times to give information, what information I had. I don't know if any of it was helpful or not um, at the time, but I, I definitely put that together and I did contact the local authorities here to, to file a report because I absolutely believe now looking back on it with the context that I had surrounding 
everything else that Alex had been doing, um, looking back on it, I said, you know, I need to at least reach out to law enforcement. So, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, yes, the Mormon stories podcast is on YouTube. You can look up Megan Connor and then you go into it a bit on our first interview as well. If people go back and listen to that carefully, she explains why she thinks it happened that in some ways it was a bit of a, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but uh, mercy killing almost. Is that, yeah, I did. I did use that, that phrase on, on one of my interviews. Yeah. I think that's it kind of what had been discussed is that, you know, Stacy was ill. She was, she was um, ill for a lot of the last few years of her life. She had some uh, complications from type one diabetes. She had a related, I believe a related eating disorder. And, um, you know, she and her parents talked, you know, from time to time about how maybe she just wasn't meant to live a long life. And, you know, maybe it was her time to go and that kind of stuff that had been discussed. We know that had been discussed. And so um, I think it's very possible given Alex's behavior, his history and the circumstances. And, and I think that 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 last part is the most important thing to consider is that when I put together how everything went that night that we found her, um, there's no doubt in my mind that it was intentional. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. And with that bit of tea, everyone will conclude. We're thinking of you and we hope that you will join with us Monday morning. Yeah. And I'll, again, I'll be there. yes, you'll be here. So I'll have the link to uh, the sentencing uh, on Monday morning, uh, later tonight or early tomorrow morning. Thanks everyone. And thank you mostly to, to Megan for being here again. Thanks, Lauren. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.